So today we're going to be doing some jewelry work um, using the brand spanking new Cameos by IOD. Um, we're going to be using epoxy sculpt, which is basically a, um, a resin clay. So when you put the two together, it creates an epoxy clay and then you press it into the mold. The key thing with epoxy clay is you have to have um, equal proportions, just like you do with any kind of epoxy or resin. Um, but it, it can be a little bit firm sometimes, so you really just have to make it more malleable just by sort of like um, playing with it in your hands. I really prefer to use nitrile gloves every time I use it, just like I do with any kind of resin or epoxy. When you get it, they very often have this little seal. Go ahead and keep those kind of tucked away. Don't chuck it. Okay, and if you accidentally forget which is which, you're like, well, how do I know which lid goes to which? The darker of the clay matches the black lid, the lighter of the clays matches the white lid. So that's always kind of a handy tool. Um, when you get it, it's like I said, it's like it can be kind of firm. So what I use is um, like one of our old transfer sticks from an old transfer, or I use a popsicle um, stick, something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out just a smidge of the darker gray. And the easiest way of kind of making sure that you get equal proportions is to roll these into balls. So I'm just going to kind of take this little guy, squish it all together, and you can kind of see that there's a little bit of separation of the binder that's in it. That's no big deal. So there's my little ball for this one. And then I'll go ahead and cap this guy off and I'll do the same thing with my other. And as long as the two um, individual pieces of clay shaped in balls roughly match the same size, you're just fine. So let's see, those are pretty darn close. So we're gonna go ahead and use those bits. When you are rubbing these together, you just basically take and smash them together kind of tear and mash and twist. Get it so mixed up that you no longer see any marbling of any kind. You want it to all be one solid color. It can be a little bit tacky and kind of get stuck to your gloves. Trust me, it's way worse if it's on your hands. There's just something about it. It's super sticky, it gets all over the place. for you to press your clay into the mold what I use is a tiny bit of olive oil on a brush you don't want this to be like a crazy greasy mess you just want just a little bit to kind of lubricate the inside of the mold and act as your release okay and then just like we always do we pull that baby out and we're left with this really sweet putty colored molded element. So at this point, you could take that piece, lay it out on a silicone mat and just let it dry. And then you have yourself a fun little cabochon to throw into a bezel like this one. I'll create a few of these. We, wanna, we don't want them all to be the putty color, which to be honest with you, the putty is actually a really neat color. Anyway, so I'm gonna leave that guy off on the side to cure. And let's do a few more. So I have a circular bezel. This one looks really fun here. It'll just take off some of the ornate details on the top. So what's really nice about the olive oil is obviously it's a really mild oil and you can just simply go and wash this out with soap and water. All right, so I've got some of this pushed in. I'm trying to get mostly the rose impression and I'm probably gonna have a little bit of clay kind of hanging over past the rose, which I can kind of remove or not remove. It's really up to you. And then I'm gonna go ahead and fill the bezel. Okay, so it doesn't have to be like perfect. And then what I do is I kind of just take my finger and rub over the surface of the clay and you end up getting this really nice, smooth, buffed out, clean finish. I do want to try to keep all the clay pushed in side of the bezel walls, okay? 
I'm gonna go ahead and pop my little rose out here. Super sweet. I'm gonna carefully lift it. Place the rose right on top of the clay that I'd pressed in. Now a lot of brushes have this angular tool on them. It's usually meant for bruising the paper when you're painting, but it's actually a perfect little tool for kind of pressing your clay down in as well. So you could have like say sculpting tools, um, or you could even use the transfer tool that I just used a little bit ago. And I'll set that piece aside to cure. So you don't have to have the exact same piece of clay to fit the bezel. Obviously, this bezel is a lot smaller than this Cameo piece here, but I really love all of the details inside of this Cameo, so I'm just gonna try to do the same impression that I did with the rose and kind of just use a small portion of it to fit inside of my bezel. So again, I'll just fill this guy up. Now be careful when you're doing this that like say for instance, the bail on the back of the pendant is the right side up and that your, your piece going in is right side up as well. This pendant just happens to be um, a pin slash pendant. So it can be a brooch or it could be a pendant, whichever you prefer. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna take a little bit of, it's one of my um, stamping grids that we have, and I'm just gonna kind of scoop underneath because this is a really delicate little piece. And I'm gonna gently push down and kind of using the edge of the bezel as my knife edge, take off the excess clay. Again, just kind of come in and press in some of these details. Remove some of the excess clay. Really pretty details. And what's interesting too is that it's not like totally flush. So you can see that the top left side up here has more space, the clay wasn't filled in completely. And I don't know, I just think sometimes details like that just make a piece more interesting. So don't fuss too much about everything perfect, everything being perfect. All right, so there's that piece I'm gonna set aside as well. Let's do, I wanna do a pendant that doesn't necessarily fit into a bezel. I think that would be kind of a fun thing to do. The other thing that's nice about this clay is that you could run a piece of wire through it while it's still soft so that you can do some basic wire wrapping and make these all into beads, essentially. Now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and pop some holes in this. All right, so the holes are now in place. That way it'll cure with the holes already there. You can always do the drill at the end, but I find with epoxy clay, it can get a little brittle. So you just wanna be really careful when you do that. The other thing that you can do is you can kind of cast this over something with a concave surface. So for me, I think this would be an absolutely lovely pendant to go onto a little bracelet later. And if I shape it over the outside container here, it'll have a bit of a concave surface, which will go over a wrist really nicely. Okay. Let's do this one one more time. Well, no, let's do different. We'll do one of the girls. And she's fantastic. You can use a craft knife, you can use a blade. Like I said, if you happen to have sculpting tools, those are awesome. They have all of the tools you would need to finish off the edge. The craft knife is 
nice and easy. Just don't go cutting yourself accidentally. Kind of just take your finger and smooth out your edges. Refine it a little bit. Okay. One of the best tools for popping holes is um, those little stir sticks that you typically get for coffee. So there's a hole there, which means that I can now, once that piece is cured, I can go ahead and wire wrap directly into that hole, add a bale or a big jump ring, whichever I prefer. And I'm gonna leave her intact on the, um, the grid here. I did olive oil on it, so it shouldn't stick, it should be fine. I just don't wanna warp the cameo, so I'm gonna leave that be. But what we've got is the really pretty little cameo piece that's set in the brooch and pendant. This one is the rose, and this is set on a post bale, which basically is meant for, say, leather cuffs. Let's put him on here, too. So a little bit of olive oil, sort of reshape it. And wouldn't you know it, I didn't have a hole in this one because this was supposed to go directly into a bezel. So again, before these cure, don't forget to put your holes in, assuming that's what you want to do. All of our pieces are cured. And you can tell because like when you tap on them, they're like seriously hard. So what we're going to do right now is use a little bit of mild dish soap and a toothbrush and just basically degrease any of the olive oil on the little pieces. All right, so all of these pieces are good and ready to go. They're nice and clean. I'm not gonna finish all of them on video for you guys. I think the idea was just to kind of show you guys how I was using the epoxy clay in the pendants, but I am going to show you one other killer technique. Um, it's an absolute favorite of mine, and again, it's coming back to the whole resin thing. So we're gonna go ahead and prep ourselves for resin. Okay, so our next step is clear resin. And there are no fast curing clear resins unless you work with UV cure resin, okay? And um, one of the tricks that I learned a long time ago is whenever you have a piece that does not sit flat because it has funny little components on the back or maybe even if the piece wasn't made um, flat and you need to level it out a little bit. This piece has a post in the middle, so it's not ideal. This one obviously is concave, so this would be a horrible situation for what we're doing next. But we're going to go ahead and do these three pieces, okay? Is I pick these up at the dollar store. I put rice in them. I always label it that it's rice um, that's used for my resin, so there's no question if you've got kiddos in the house or even if you forget. And you basically just kind of level the rice out, give it a little wiggle, and then you can go ahead and rest your pieces in them and kind of make sure that they're level, even if they have those funny little components on the back, okay? So I'm gonna just do the cameo piece by itself and then do the two post bezels side by side in the other one. The trick with pouring resin on something like this is resin is pretty cute, pretty cool in that it basically will hold its surface tension. So it'll it'll stay where it's supposed to stay as long as you don't have too much volume. Like there's not so much resin that it's basically being forced over the edge of the pendant. So we're just going to literally use a toothpick. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and pour out one ounce of part B. 
I don't need a ton of resin. Just a tiny, tiny bit. This is just a top coat. Then I'm gonna go ahead and do one ounce of part A. You know, the key to resin, especially when you're working with clear resin, is to try to use a folding motion, not so much a stirring motion. So it's very bubbly right now because I was stirring kind of aggressively just to make sure that we had it all done and didn't drive you guys bonkers forever while I stirred. I've got two more little medicine cups. I'm going to go ahead and pour just a smidge of this resin into those. Okay. And then we can go ahead and actually mix up a little bit of acrylic. So the ones I'm using are golden high flow acrylics, which means that they're super, super liquidy already. And I'm going to stir those together. It's going to give me a wonderful, almost walnut stain color. I'm going to take that and stir that into my resin. And I can choose to do more. I can choose to do less. I just want these pieces to look a little bit old. So, I mean, it's it's barely, let me put it up against something white so you can see. It's barely got kind of like a sepia pink tint to it, which is exactly what a lot of like vintage intaglios look like because they're old and sort of aged. But if at any point I feel like I want to add more, I totally can. Now I'm going to use turquoise. It's a phthalo turquoise. This one is a fluid acrylic, which means that it's, um, it's thin, but it's not as thin as the high flow. So I'm going to do a drop. This was a ton of paint, a ton. So there's a very good chance that this is going to be a lot darker. Yep. But what I was kind of going for was almost like a, um, a sea glass kind of effect. And it's just an absolute gorgeous color. If I want to get it even lighter, I can simply add more resin to it. Or I could even dilute um, the color just by simply taking a little of this batch and pouring it into a batch of more resin as well. So it's always good to have a little extra resin just in case. Like seriously, what's sort of left in the bottom of this cup is enough for me to sort of take and drop a couple drops. And now I've really, really diluted it and have a much softer color as opposed to that really, really vibrant Kind of um, phthalo green color. All right, so let's see here. We're gonna go, I think we're gonna go with this nice sepia tint for our girl. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of just take my little toothpick and go over all of the highest points on my cameo. Gravity is going to pull all of this resin down to the lower points I just want to make sure that the resin has a chance to sort of touch on the very top raised points of this setting. Now you might be asking, why would you do any colored resin on this at all? And the reason that I typically do it is because I like to see some of those details really pop in a cast cameo piece.
you want to let this cure six to eight hours is a standard cure time for resin um, however it's always a really good idea to kind of give it 48 hours if you can um, I'm horrible like I give it the six to eight hours when I wake up in the morning it's like free game it's like I'm going in and checking them so so it's like Christmas morning right you get to unveil the resin pieces so our pieces are done <clears throat> and they are so fun. My absolute favorite leather cuffs are vintage belts and you can find these suckers all over the place. Um, <clears throat> and I, these have obviously taken kind of a beating cause I, I use and cut them up on a regular basis, but they just have wonderful aging to them. If you want something that's not so aged, you can go with a slightly newer looking belt. Um, if you want a cuff that's already assembled, you don't have to worry about um, setting snaps or anything like that, then you can just simply buy a ready-made cuff. They sell them um, by, by Tandy Leather. They sell them at Michael's. Super, super easy to get your hands on a, on a ready-made leather cuff. So when you're putting a leather cuff on, <clears throat> you wanna make sure that you overlap quite a bit. And so I like an overlap of goodness probably like at least an inch inch and a half it it tends to be like a way more comfortable one and then if you're having a day where you're slightly more um bloated or something you know it's not super super tight you can adjust it to a second size if you need to so i'm gonna go ahead and cut here okay now i have this fancy little tool if you wanted you could just simply cut your leather in a straight line and kind of round it out with some scissors um, I've been doing leather smithing for a while here, so I have all of the tools. I have the mallet, and this is basically just a leather mallet, and this is a cutting tool, which is largely used for belts or purse straps. So that guy is ready to go. And as you can see, <laughs> it's even a little bit shorter actually than I'd originally anticipated. So my snap is gonna be a one snapper. But I'm going to go ahead and figure out the center of this. You can always use a ruler. All right, so this is an inch and a half. So I'm going to go at three quarters of an inch into the center. This is a Tim Holtz ruler. I absolutely love this ruler. This is a hole punch specifically for leather, but again, you could use a nail or something of the like. You don't have to go out and buy this. But again, I use this a lot and I make my own straps and stuff like that so it's really handy. Just kind of squeeze and you end up with a perfect little hole for my first. Snap hole. And then what I do is I come over and sort of line it up where it's supposed to go and take my pen Leave myself a little squiggly dot so it's easy to see. And that's ready to go. Okay, so I'm back. I have my steel bench block. <clears throat> I have my snap accessories. I went ahead and laid the top of this snap down into the cradle. This is um, a little piece here that comes with the set of snaps that I buy so that it maintains the shape of the actual snap head. It doesn't flatten out or get all warped. And then I'm gonna go ahead and slide my leather cuff. Again, cradle that right back in there. Snap on the appropriate side. I'm gonna bring this up a smidge so I don't whack it with the hammer. Okay, and that piece is fully nestled in there. Sometimes it takes a little minute to get the little post back out again, but that's nice and set. Then you bring it over and you're like, okay, so I need to put this piece in upside down. So it's the opposite of what you had done the first time around. And sometimes the hole, since you punched from the other side, gets a little bit stubborn and you have to drive like an awl through it just to give you enough room. come back through. So I'm pressing it nice and tight here, making sure that post has plenty of room to come out. 
I'm gonna turn this around. So this was the top of the snap. This side, you can tell, fits this little component. I'm gonna go ahead and rock that into place there. And I have a nicely set snap. Now I'm gonna go ahead and unscrew the washer back. Don't lose that, set it somewhere safe. Drop that right into the hole that we made for ourselves earlier. Screw the washer back on. And you wanna to try to get that as tight as possible. You have to be really careful. Most people, when they're setting a post like this, would simply use a ball peen hammer and kind of smooth out the back and get it to flay out. You can't do that with a um, very fragile uh, pendant on the front of this because if you took a hammer to this, you're gonna crack that. So what you have to do is kind of improvise. And what I do is I take a very strong shear. This is called a Kiba cutter. K-E-I-B-A. It's absolutely the best shear cutter I've ever used because most of the time my hands feel like they're going to fall off um, every time I use a pair of pliers to cut something because, you know, it's really hard to cut and it hurts. So I cut that down as flush as I could go. I could probably go just a little bit more flush. But then I'm going to go ahead and sand that down. But once I'm done, I'm also going to run a little bit of glue on it, okay? So the glue will kind of seep in there and hold my little bezel steady. So how do you sand it? Well, I use a Dremel. Safety first. Always, always, always wear your safety glasses whenever you are doing any kind of sanding, um, especially when you're working with any kind of metal. A little metal burr in the eye, big time no-no. So putting my safety glasses on, I've attached a sanding head to the tip of my Dremel, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on and gently sand the back. Just like that, you have a nice smooth back, no sharp burr edge on the back of that bezel tool. And then like I said, um, if you ran a little bit of like super glue on the back of that, just to kind of seep in, let it dry the appropriate amount of time, you'll have an even better hold. If you're like, I just don't want this thing to fall off, I wanna make sure it's definitely stuck in there. Before you've gone all the way down with the washer, if you let the glue kind of seep into the threads of the post and screw this little piece on, just make sure you don't glue your finger to the post. Um, you can let the glue dry, then cut off your post and then sand it. And then you've got a really, really solid hold and connection, okay? But now you have like this really, really beautiful cuff and it's super unique and nobody else is gonna have anything like it. And obviously the leather cuff makes it even more special.